business is approval of minutes. We have two sets. We've got the regular meeting minutes from November the 2nd, 2015, and then the work session on November the 9th. I move that we accept the minutes for the November 2nd meeting uh, as presented. I'll second that. We moved and seconded the minutes for the November 2nd commission meeting to be approved as submitted. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll move we approve the minutes of the November 9th work, to work session as submitted. I'll second that. We moved and seconded the, the um, minutes for the November 2nd, I'm sorry, the November 9th work session be approved as submitted. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations, David. He just completed 4,000 hours. Thank you. Tree trimmer. He's now a journeyman tree trimmer. Last week we ended up with a lot of high water on the port, so we had uh, relatively we had a few problems. Uh, one of the one of the worst ones we had is up on the Brandonberry lots, way up on the upper hull. We lost a couple sections of cable. We lost a transformer. Um, There's also four houses that went into the river up there. Um, three of them are completely gone. There's one that's still kind of sitting in the middle of the channel. That's, it's, it's there, but it's not where it used to be. Um, that, that aerial is kind of an Did the people have to move photo. out of it? It's, 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 <laughs> so the actual route now of the river is down along that white, that white path. There. Yeah, we wanted to transform the walls. Yeah, if you look at the white dotted line, it kind of cuts. That's and then the blue line is where the cable's gone, and then that, of course, that that transformer. The one in the middle there was washed. We don't know where it's at. It's just gone. Um, 
The crew went back out this morning. They're removing another at-risk transformer. Um, no sense of letting it go in the river. It's probably the river's the weather report for this week. Uh, the rivers may crest higher than what they did last week. So uh, we're looking at probably having probably some more issues up there. We may lose a cable, but at least we may not lose another transformer. So. Um, and expect uh, the rain tonight and then tomorrow and then wind heavy, heavy wind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, soils are pretty much saturated. Um, I was out here yesterday and where the crew did their temporary shoe fly around the, the damaged portion, there's so much water bubbling out of the ground that it's, it's just unreal. And you sent some pictures of the flooding out there to well, the night of work. Thanks, Bill. This water isn't even flowing up the river anymore. It's actually through here. I don't know, it's probably lower for you or know, whatever. The, the white line now is pretty much the main channel of the river. Yeah. And it goes where it wants to go. Well, that, it sure does. That yeah. just happened with high water. Without, I mean, this river cutting through this another channel is. There was, there has always been like a little creek running through there, yeah. but it went from the little creek to the main channel pretty much in two days. So and that's why it took out those four homes. And most of them, uh, Phil was saying, are, are summer places, but there was one that had people. I, I have some photos of the damage up here. Uh, I was having trouble with my computer this morning, so I <laughs> I didn't get them sent out. But um, if you guys would like to see some pictures of some of this stuff, I can also send some pictures out later this afternoon. Yeah, appreciate that. What are you going to Oscar? What are you going to screen those up? Remember my geology. Okay, thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Okay, the next business item is resolution 2040-15, Mass Mutual Deferred Compensation Plan. Yes, we are asking that the district amends the um, 457 Deferred Compensation Plan with Mass Mutual um, to reflect the addition of a Roth 457 to the plan. So this is an additional resource for employees to add to their retirement savings um, that we can offer through Mass Mutual. Yeah, I see they, no, they do not have one. So this is a newer feature to Mass Mutual and Rob Johnson, our representative, um, you know, kind of sold it to us this year, and so we'd like to bring it out to the employees as well. No, no cost to the PUD. Yep, no cost, very little admin. Um, it'll be similar to what Cindy's already processing for their deferred compensation program. Um, it's just an additional check we'll be sending if employees choose to participate. The limits are still the same, yeah. uh, but you can split them if you, if you understand the, the Roth versus the, the regular yeah. 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 taxable versus non taxable, or when it's taxed, basically. Can they transfer from their 457 that they have now to the Roth and pay the taxes? Or? That we have not dug that deep into, but we can definitely check with Rob. We're actually, um, Rob will be out December 9th for our benefits fair, and so he will be talking to employees about this um, new feature. So, do you need a? I guess you have yeah, we have a resolution. resolution. I'll move that we. Uh, adopt resolution 2040-15, establishing the deferred compensation plan with Mass Mutual. Second that. Moved and seconded for adoption of resolution 2040-15, establishing the deferred compensation plan with Mass Mutual. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, they, 
under and just to add to that, the district wouldn't have a problem with that. I, I don't think the, the district, district. No, but the employees may. Yeah, it would be the employee's decision to do it if that's something it, they can do. As far as the, the district's concerned, we don't no uh, say we don't care, but we uh, wouldn't want to influence that. that. Uh, and you know, if, uh, if it's similar, which in other cases, it is similar to a regular Roth. Yeah. There was a window in which you could do that, but I thought that that window had closed. Oh, uh, really? and, and I'm not sure. Under um, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I imagine that that is basically the same. But <coughs> check on it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. What's the chances of the other RCMA offering that? So what they're competing, so. Yeah, we have a new representative, so we'll have, we have yet to be able to meet with them, so we'll have to yeah. chat with them. Our next business item is Renewable Energy Credits Purchase Business. Yes, as we talked um, about at our work session, I don't know, several weeks ago, um, <coughs> this is, uh, a confirmation letter number three and it's a, an addendum to an existing contract we have with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. This one is for uh, distributed generation recs. It's from a small wind project. The recs are for vintage years 2022, 2023, and 2024. So they add um, a total of um, 11,000 recs each year for that. They are a, a firm product, which means if these um, resources don't produce, then they're obligated to procure an equivalent amount of recs for us at the same price. Um, with, with these recs, we are good through 2022 under our current load forecast, and we're short 8,000 400 recs in 2023. And then 2024 and beyond, we're short about 50, 50 to 60,000 recs. So that's an area where we're short, but we want to see how the market, you know, behaves over the next couple of years and just continue to uh, diversify our rec portfolio, so to speak. So it'd be, um, Staff's recommendation that the board authorize the general manager to enter into confirmation letter number three <coughs> for the Bonneville uh, Environmental Foundation. I'll move the <coughs> general manager to execute that confirmation letter number three with Bonneville Environmental Foundation. Been moved and seconded to authorize the general manager to execute confirmation letter number three with the Bonneville environmental foundation all those in favor aye. 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 so aye. actually we've got 23 all taken care of now so we just have 24 and 25 well 2023 were 8,000 short oh they are okay. 2024 and beyond were 50,000 short so there's a bigger hole okay. in, in what we have in the, uh, the use of Rex has been under some pressure if there's if the rules change we made a commitment what does that leave us? I think I know the answer. But my hope would be that grandfather transactions that have occurred, um, yeah, you know, know, prior to any change. But um, no, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds too logical. But <laughs> that's <what laughs> right. Okay. Our next business item is delinquent accounts, Dave. Uh, yeah, you have uh, the delinquent accounts for, actually it's October, that uh, summary of large accounts says September on it, it should be October, the other one actually uh, says November 5th, which is basically October accounts. And uh, we recommend that you remove the delinquent accounts from the list dated November 5th. 2015 in the amount of six thousand four fifty six ninety from the active accounts receivable including a collection fee of one thousand four oh eight ninety 
and I gave you, I believe, a, a graph which really kind of indicates we're not in too bad a shape this year compared to the last uh, four years. Well, I'd move that we uh, approve the removal of delinquent accounts on the listed date, November 5th, 2015, uh, in the total amount of $6,456.90. The act would not receive rule improvement of $1,000 and $8.80. I'll second that. Then I uh, move and second it for approval to remove uh, the accounts on the list dated November the 5th, 2015. The total amount of $6,456.90 for the active accounts receivable, including a collection fee of $1,408.90. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Dave, what would this graph look like for like 2009? This starts in 2000. Um, I don't know. I can no, you don't go back know. and check. I don't know that they just wondered if it would look much steeper. You know, I'm not sure. Right I, we can go back and look. I, I well, don't know that the graph was done out. prior to that. But just curiosity. Yeah, I don't know. I yeah. can look. You do your thing, but after. Uh, 2008. Yeah, that that would have been the, the high spot, for, especially for businesses, I would, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Next item is resolution 2041-15 dollar amounts for working funds. Yeah, uh, basically related to the fact that we're we're going to be closing down the, this office and closing down the SQUIM office and then moving to Carlsberg and then opening those two satellite offices. We found that we will need an additional amount of working funds for basically. Some people refer to it as petty cash, but it really isn't petty cash, it's just change yeah. funds. Yeah. And uh, so that's what this does. It just basically, uh, I think it increased it by about $400 total. And the base amount was uh, 8150 here? Yeah. So and I, I don't have the, the old no, amount. I've got the resolution, it's 8150. Yeah. So it's Right, so it's not that um, many. No, it's not. It's not much different. Uh, and uh, you know, I normally wouldn't think that this would require a resolution, but there was a a memo that was put out by the state auditor's office in 1983 or something like that, and we still follow that. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> when you saw, I would go right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we uh, recommend that you adopt resolution 2041-15 re-establishing the dollar amounts for the working funds and rescinding resolution 1973-12. I'll move that we adopt resolution 2041-15, re-establishing the dollar amounts for the working funds and rescinding resolution 1973-12. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2041-15, establishing the dollar amounts for the working funds, and rescinding resolution 1973-12. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.
item here is comments from the public. Having done, uh, correspondence and communications. I've got one thing I wanted to mention to you. Uh, some months ago, we had a work session with Energy Northwest regarding uh, uh, board of excellence and excellent programs. And uh, one of the things that I'm working on uh, the rest of it, but one of them was to critique yourselves at the end of a meeting. Um, so what I did, I just took Energy Northwest for now. But if you can look these over in order to uh, help uh, have excellence in meeting criteria, critique, uh, if you look over, it's, still, it's an Energy Northwest one, but we uh, recognize it. <laughs> uh, certainly can uh, update it, change it to uh, all of UD. But the questions, uh, some of them seem to be you know, appropriate and, and fit our meetings uh, too. I mentioned the fifth one down. Uh, did we have open, intrusive, and relevant discussion? When we had met, do we have changed that intrusive? In the nuclear industry, intrusive, intrusive, I guess it's. Although, uh, I think it was Angela was also saying that you're, you were also looking at changing that to possibly cooperative, or I forget what the word we had. We had some other word in there. I would tell like intrusive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, if you can look these over, Make any comments you want and uh, see you know, how you want to use this. Uh, we could certainly do that uh, at the end of each meeting. I think they use this at energy on the web. It's a self critique, so you just, you just do a thumbs up or thumbs down. So it's pretty quick. Okay, so if you have any comments you might have, and then I can make up the, the form for you if you so desire. Okay. So, cool. Anything else? Uh, no. All right, we have two sets of claim vouchers, one for November the 9th, 2015, and one for November the 16th, 2015. Okay, that's just okay. Um, November the 9th, uh, no change, $251,552. for November the 9th, uh, 2015, in the amount of $251,553.36. For November 9th, 2015, you paid in the amount of $251,552.36. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Council Member Dewey approved the amended claim vouchers for November 16th in the amount of 131078 cents. Second. Moved and seconded the claim vouchers for November 16, 2015, be approved in the revised amount of $131,000.78. Dollars in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> on the uh, claim vouchers for the ninth day, on the second page, there's a uh, Brennan, Thomas, or Morgan. And then there's an acronym that E S M H. That would be some sort of uh, conservation. conservation thing. I, all yeah. I could think of would be energy star. Yeah, energy star manufacturer. Energy star. Energy star. star. Energy star. star. Energy star. star. Uh, MH. Manufacturer column. Is it $850? 800 or 850 something like that, yeah. Uh, no, this is 200 bucks. Uh, it was, uh, 
it says MHPTCS uh, rebate. That would be manufactured home duct sealing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the other one for Brennan was uh, 850. Eight 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 yeah. Too many actors. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think they probably do it that way just because they don't have enough space to put all yeah, well, that yeah, stuff I don't understand that. I blame the pipes. If you go out the way, you get fines for good fusion I made my contribution. You mean an ENW? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they the ones that operate the CGS? She and Georgia. Yeah, or the CPA. decision, I guess. And the, this organization provided some funding. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, I think I remember that. basically all of the funding uh, for the thing. I guess that goes away. I, I don't know the particulars. Yeah. 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 Try and continue the thing. Or yeah, re-up on it.
might mention to them that you know, we're 50 years in this building, yeah. and this is our last meeting in this building. So our next meeting, not next week, but the following week, will be a business meeting in our new building. Okay. Okay. Them all out. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll do that. And now we do have that grand opening uh, oh, December. Well. Last week I went to the went to the luncheon at the chamber, the Swift Chamber, and uh, besides introducing, well, I think our uh, our communications person was there also, or at least part of it. And what they basically, I mean, they introduced the new members and they talked about renewing members and all that. Um, wasn't anything really really major that was happening. Uh, but then Wednesday and Thursday, I went to uh, NOAAC. We had our NOAAC meeting over, and actually uh, Fred was there, and actually sat next to me in the meeting. And actually we talked about where Clown PUD was, was doing in the telecom business. and. Uh, And I think it was good. I mean, I think I think we chose the right way to go on that. I mean, there's too many people around here doing no one that, I mean, doing telecom and all that and everything else. I think we, we picked the right way to go. I mean, I hear about, I see all these other PUDs that they spent millions and millions of dollars on deploying this fiber. And they don't seem to be really making that much. I mean. And, it's, and they're always they're always having more and more problems with it. So I think we went we ended up going the right way. The uh, I think that that was about and then, you know at knowing that meetings they go through all the money that they've dispersed and you know all the projects that they're working on. It's hard to follow sometimes they go so fast through some of that, but. Uh, they're always busy. I mean, they, they got, well, how many employees do they have now? About 60? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we're not building, they're not building any more, you know, uh, on that federal program. So this is just maintaining, isn't it? Yeah, it's, they continue to uh, leverage those VTOP funds uh -huh. that allow them to get new equipment, that allows them to sell more bandwidth. And, customers that have uh, been with us starting five years ago, their five-year contracts are expiring and a lot of them are coming back for renewal. Yeah. But they're getting three times as much bandwidth for the same price. That's, right. that's the nature. The price of is that. always going down on these new contracts. Uh, I think we just renegotiated with Microsoft, didn't we? And, and, and the right price was probably a third of what we, we originally got from them. They wanted sort of a, they at least wanted us still in it, but they wanted to have a different format in terms of how we provide them internet, ser I mean, uh, fiber service. It, it's almost like uh, intermediate to flat to dark fiber. Right. They want to be able to tune. Yeah the frequency of the lighting so that they can expand or contract the bandwidth available to them. So, other than that's the only two things I did last week. So, I guess for um, you look curious, thank you. Um, yeah, just one question on that. Benton is still doing, uh, well, they, they got 20% of knowing that, right? 20 some odd I think their share is pretty high. Pretty high. Um, yeah. And what Benton did is they eliminated all of their wholesale telecom employees, two or three of which went to work for Noanet. And then they contract with Noanet to do all of their wholesale telecommunications work for them. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. 
previous presentation, they made the statement that they looked on Wi-Fi as a very short-term interim solution, and that's a big solution up here, the last mile, I guess. So is there a difference in velocity there? There is, and, and we've been, I think, in a good position because the service providers have been the one deploying the yeah. wire, last mile wireless. Many of the other utilities made that investment and then, you know, they're kind of running out. Like yeah. A lot of money spent that. Oh, that, that's what I look at. But they have a down. Yeah, they got this. They have a down, so they can spend that money. Well, I, uh, I went down to PBC, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? A couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, bottom, I wanted to hear Bonneville's uh, reference case overview where they went, uh, looked into the future 10 or 15 years and uh, tell us where Tier 1 was going. And they, they said a number of things that they typically say, like uh, in real terms, rates have not increased over the last know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, which would imply it was tracked inflation. But we all know that's not true. <laughs> so, you know. so anyway, the follow-up, and I've got the uh, a dashboard here, a little synopsis by uh, Kevin O'Meara. If anybody wants to read it, I won't go into all of it. But uh, they did thank Energy Northwest for their, you know, reducing their cost of money by refinancing bonds, yeah. and. Uh, implied that we're going to continue doing that into the future, but we're kind of running up against the wall where we, we're going to be kicking the can down the road. So that'll be an interesting discussion. So we, uh, interest rates are probably going to go up from yeah. now on. Yeah. Unless things get really bad and I don't know where I'm going to Not much, <laughs> depends not on no place for them to go. But, yeah. but anyway, if anybody wants to Maybe. read through this, it's kind of interesting. It's about did, did the any, excuse me. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did, did they have any projections for the future uh, as far as uh, they presented uh, generation uh, or graphs, graphs and things here on transmission rates, uh, tier one rates out through uh, 2030. And uh, as you can see, the curves are going up, but in real terms, of course. The, No, the big issue is, I mean, the flat rates look attractive because that's what we um, look for in terms yeah. of rate stability. The problem is the early years are larger rate increases. The outer years are more flat or smaller rate increases, and when you normalize those, it looks like a flat adjustment. But yeah. the, the challenge with that is it's easier to, you know, What's the saying? You know, would you rather have a? I'll, I'll gladly pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today, or whatever you know the saying went, and and that's kind of the issue that you're almost guaranteed that you're going to have rate increases in the seven to eight percent the first couple of rate periods, and then it's easy for them to say it's going to be flat after that. But um, historically, it has. It hasn't been that way. I'd rather see them have them lower in the early years when it really yeah, makes a difference. Just like our philosophy of small incremental right. increases to cover our cost. Um, the other thing they didn't really give any warm, fuzzy feelings on was their borrowing authority. And what was going to happen? They keep looking look at Energy Northwest to get them out there. But, you know, there's just so much energy Northwest can do. So, is their relationship with the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury, changing at all? Or are they still, mm -hmm. no, I don't think Same thing, so. thing they same just limits. Everything they, well, it's a weird way to do business. Uh, well, you, you know, they go to the bank every year and borrow enough money to run their outfit. Well, Somebody got a line of credit, right? They just yeah, line of credit. Uh, I guess that's what you call it. Uh, That rat hole on their money. Yeah, uh, they're not good at that. No, they're not. They're sure good at spending it. Well, you know, the, 
Energy Northwest we tried to say, well, the executive board has said, well, you know, cost reduction, we want to review your cost reduction efforts, we want to review your capital spending. None of that seems to be happening. So it's hard to hold Bonneville accountable. Right. So, and when they come to us, they say, well, you either approve this, or we've got double digit, double digit rate increases. Right. So, you know, what do you do? Uh, the other thing I did, I went to the Chamber of Commerce board meeting for the Squam Dundonist Chamber. Uh, the only two partners were there were the Squam and myself. Um, the court wasn't there or the county. So I had a lot of time to talk. So, <laughs> so, anyway, so we uh, talked about the, build, the new building. There seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for that. Uh, the compliments on it. Uh, invited them all to participate in our dedication ceremony. Gave them our schedule for moving in. So, uh, yeah, we got pretty good feedback on that. Um, what else happened there? I know a few babies that were born in the weights, but I, don't, I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, that's all I had. <laughs> Next item is uh, staff reports. Uh, comes to go. Oh, which one of I, have we received the. Uh, Feedback on the life of our combat fluorescent bulbs. But, uh, you know, they were advertised for 12,000 hours or something like that. This is CFLs, not the LEDs, CFLs, right? The old yeah. CFLs you were But uh, we haven't had a chance to look at that yet. No, and you know, it's just like anything depends on the you know, the environment they're installed the service, in, or, yeah. quality control, you know, they're all come out of China and ship to here, so, you know, out of the, I don't know, whether we give out more than probably 100,000 light bulbs, there's bound to be some that just don't well, yeah, just, you know, meet the standard and last very long. Bathtub here, infant mortality and longevity. I expect that the LEDs will be a little more robust and probably have a better life than the, than the CFLs with that ballast in there and so forth. Yeah. Well, we've got a letter from Yep. Claimed that he was getting 540 hours or something on the life out of right. which is a long way from uh, But I, But was that one ball or? I think that was what he was saying that he's gotten several. several that he's putting in a certain place and he's just not getting, he's not getting 12,000 hours or 10,000 hours like that. Yeah. Advertisement of claims. Like fixture. <laughs> Did we get our LEDs? Well, I was just thinking, um, we still have some of the LEDs left. Does this gentleman want we can try to give him some of those, unless he's entirely tired of getting lamps on us. Which we don't have to push on, on either. See, if follow up fellows did depend a lot on, you know, if you put them in these cans, they were saying their life's not quite as good and that, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. So the outside would be another thing. Uh, so there are different conditions. Yeah. Yeah. The um, LEDs come from China? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So they all came from China. Every, every day comes from China. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. I just thought maybe there was a chance that maybe they weren't. The other comment I heard on the bulbs, uh, a lot of people are not receiving them. It's the delivery method. It's the mail. It's not, not our bulb. Uh, where they've got community mailboxes, they'll just stack the boxes out. Oh. Well, those people can come in and, and sign something to get new ones or to, to get four bulbs. But once you send them out to an address, it's... Well, see, the, the LEDs, we didn't do a direct right. mail. And so... That's right, they picked them up. Yeah. Right. Those oh, were, um, you know, giveaways at the fair right. or out of the offices and so forth. The last direct mail we did it was the CFL. CFL. And then after that was this smart power strip. That yeah, we just got ours. Yeah. Well, yeah, i got to say, the uh, chamber board meeting, there was a lot of excitement over that. And they kept saying, it's free, it's free, and it was not free. <laughs> <laughs> and that, smaller, what can I say? <laughs> that really has gone pretty well, I think. We may have 40% by the time we're done. 
Yeah. Which is pretty good. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. Have, have you received them? I, I got, got mine. mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I haven't got mine yet. I haven't got mine either. Yeah. There's still some at the local post offices. The, the delivery trucks are only so big, so they take a batch, batch at a time, and oh, eventually you should get to it. And depending when you order, Ty, Tyler said that the, the first batch sort of came in, and then they're going to work on the next batch to send to the post office right. as well. Right. So. Okay, uh, back to staff reports, conservation potential assessment 2015. Sorry about that. Are you going to help? Project anything? No projection. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, this is from DES. So just a little set up for today's meeting. What we'd like to do today is uh, go through an overview of the conservation potential assessment. This is the third one we've done. It's uh, an assessment that looks actually looks 20 years out, looks more specifically at 10 years out, and then it's used to establish our two-year potential that then sets up our budget and our activities for the next couple of years. So um, EES has done this for us the last uh, twice before, and then um, this time as well. There's been some changes in the measures and so forth, and, and Matthias will go through some of that. There's been uh, changes in what the uh, forward cost of energy is that have all resulted in a downward pressure on what the uh, target is for us. And that ultimately will have some um, impact on the final budget that's proposed uh, for the board's consideration in December. And then our plan is to allow you, uh, after today's presentation, to kind of review this. If you have any more questions, more input, and we'll bring this back to the board on the 14th of December, along with the resolution for the budget, establishing the strategic plan, and we'll establish our conservation potential that will set our targets for the next couple of years. What date are you bring this back? The 14th. Okay, so with that, Matthias has got uh, some handouts and a, a presentation to kind of take you through the highlights of the, of the plan. Right. So I'm just going to figure, while we're on the topic, i just give you a, you know, start with a quick update on the current biennials. As you recall, on May 32nd, we'll be in the Independence Act, those are two-year biennials, and we're currently closing out the 14-15 biennial, and the CPA is specifically directed at uh, the 16-17. And then I'll go give you a little overview of the CPA, or the Conservation Potential Assessment. That's my first acronym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, talk about, you know, give you a little bit of historical context with the CPA and how it relates to some of the past two years, you know, the past CPAs and past conservation activities, and then give you some next steps that we sort of covered. So if we go to slide number, number three, we're looking at the current biennium, and the target we had was a little over 12,000 12, uh, megawatt hours. And currently we required about 6,000 megawatt hours through our um, own conservation programs. We're gonna have, uh, um, we have been allocated NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, who do sort of re regional promotions of conservation activity and, and market transformation. They allocate savings to us, so from them, we got we we got uh, 2,700 megawatt hours for 2014, and we're projected to get another 2,000 from them for 2015. Um, and then, so when we add this smart or advanced power strip promotion done and some conservation activity, we haven't reported to BPA yet. We should close out the biennium well over the target you know, with some extra savings that we'll be able to roll over and claim in the next biennium. Don't just lose savings by going over the target. So that's really a change from the last biennium. Is is now we have the potential of carrying uh, conservation kilowatt hours. There is a limit. There is a limit. It can up to twenty percent of 
your uh, target? 20% of the acquisition may come from fire biennials. It's a little hard to know exactly how much we can roll over until we have an established target. But then also we can only roll it forward two years. So there's sort of, you know, you can't roll over everything. So it still you know, makes sense to not push too hard in conservation at the same time. It just makes sense to go over and carry things forward to hedge ourselves in the future. So either way, we're looking really good for the current current year. Um, so then if we look at the CPA, sort of the key, key drivers behind the CPA, and what it does, like Fred said, really looks out 20 years into the future to really find the cheapest you know, strategy to meet our customers' energy needs. So what we do is we look at future power prices. When market prices are really high, conservation makes a lot of sense. When market prices are low, conservation makes less sense because electricity is cheap. And currently, we're looking at a you know, fairly soft electrical market going out into the future. Um, other things that affect the target is you know, past activities, essentially. We, you know, as you know, we've been doing conservation for the past 20 years, and homes are getting more and more efficient, partially due to changes in the energy codes, but really also through the efforts of the programs that we have. Um, other things uh, that affect it is um, the Regional Technical Forum, which is a branch of the, the Power Council, have done some revisions to, you know, the, what they, partially what the Regional Technical Forum does is evaluates conservation measures and try to determine exactly how much they save. And they, you know, particularly the last some years, they've looked at the residential measure set and sa savings are being revised down, about 40% less savings from insulation of windows and those types of things. So there's many uh, residential measures that are no, no longer cost effective because the market prices are low and they don't save as much as we used to think they do. Um, and then also we have the addition of indoor ag into the fourth quarter that we need to start considering as we go forward uh, with our CPA and through our conservation programs. And indoor ag is specifically related to marijuana growing. Uh, but we tend to use the term indoor ag because it can grow cucumbers Indoors, you know, we want to address that too. It's just uh, on the <laughs> <laughs> so, if you then uh, on the fifth slide, there we have I have a little chart where we compare the current CPA, the 2015 CPA that I just handed out, with the 2013 CPA. And if you look at the far right column, you can see the percentage change from the you know, CPA the last two years. You know, in general, targets down by about 40%. Um, you know, the only growth really is in the industrial sector, but that specifically is the indoor ag we're talking about. You know, with the loss of the two sawmills out of forks, you know, otherwise the traditional industrial savings is down because when the mills close, then we can't save the there. Because of the added load of indoor ag, that, part, that portion of the target is going up. And that 40% is consistent with other utilities in the region. They're seeing 30, 40% drops in their uh, conservation potential as well. Conservation. Yeah. Assessment. Yeah. Maybe not a fair question. Do you, do you think this will continue to drop? Uh, Conservation market uh, getting saturated. <coughs> well, the seven, the draft seven power plan just came out, and in it, there's you know there's plenty, you know nothing but conservation really for the next twenty years. But you know definitely you know with the short short term, I would expect it to just to, to uh, the targets to be fairly low. You know specifically related to the market prices. You know I don't see. You know, the, the factors that I just talked about, for instance, um, revisions of savings values, you know, the, the Regional Technical Forum, you know, just completed that review, so they're not, probably not going to go back and look at insulation and windows again for, for another five to ten years. But those are, those are, you know, 50 to 100 year, uh, at least insulation, uh, for the most part, that, that, that's a, yeah, long, long life, right? Yeah, uh, 
But I think it's specifically really windows. Like, you know, will next year in, in October of 2016, BPA will eliminate windows incentives because it's just not cost effective. So, and, and part of that's driven by the studies they did in terms of how much energy savings does this retrofitting windows really accomplish. So that produces kilowatt hours per square feet of window. And then part of it is um, with the forward price of energy, your avoided cost is lower. So you've got lower savings per measure. Windows are very expensive to install. So by the time you look at what you can afford to pay, it's just a measure that drops off because it no longer meets that cost effectiveness test. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Do uh, our requirements uh, under the uh, Energy Conservation Act uh, fit the Decline in uh, available conservation. Yes, that was one of the things that we wanted to make sure of this time through. Is hey, we've we've offered CFLs to every residence in the county. We've offered low flow shower heads to every residence in the county. So we need to account that we've accomplished that. But since those are short life measures, they come in five years later, and so when your plan is based on the next ten years, those measures that are short-lived kind of reappear. But in terms of the 40 percent decrease in overall target, that's, I mean, it's consistent with the seventh power plan and, and all the planning that's done in the region saying, we don't need new resources and we can meet our load growth through um, energy conservation. So you get credit for LEDs again in five years, is what you're saying? Or? Yeah. I mean, we... we less. Because the baseline changes. You know, we used to account for CFLs assuming that the existing lamp was 60 watts. So when we look at LEDs now, right. the assumption is that we have a 13 watt CFL going to an 8 watt LED. So while that's cost effective, you know, the savings so then uh, the next couple of slides we just move along to number six it's sort of, you know it's a couple of charts that just gives you the breakdown of the potential in the various sectors so in the residential the largest potential is consumer electronics and what that is is you know the advanced power strips that we just handed out that is to address the potential of consumer electronics. Um, it also gets covered through efforts by NIA, who have programs to promote energy efficient uh, televisions and set top boxes. Uh, another big potential is water heating, and you know, partially that includes the heat pump water heaters. But I'm sure you may have seen some promotions come to your, your mailbox. They're primarily, those promotions are primarily driven by GE, we just figured we might, you know, since they're promoting them, we might as well, you know, sort of be, have some involvement because it does represent a large part of our potential. Our, our assessment of that technology, though, is that it's, you know, not quite mature yet. So we, when we put together the CPA, more of the potential to keep up water heater lies beyond the 10 years that I-937 uh, I really looks at. So because the CPA looks at 20 years, you know, which is another 10 years beyond that we're required to look at. Now that uh, bailout said it was available at Lowe's, and that's all it said. Is it available elsewhere? I don't think there's a Lowe's out here anywhere, is it? I think there is South Silverdale. Silverdale. My team in Silverdale. Did you get a fair bit of updates from those mail? You know, lots of phone calls, but every time those mailers are gone out, we get about 50 heat pump water heaters or so that go through our program, mm -hmm. which what we figure is a good start. You know, we're not quite ready really to push it onto all of our customers yet, but at the same time, knowing that we one day have to do it, 
I think it's a good idea, you know, to you know sort of to get our local plumbers to used to looking at the product, product and you know engage with their uh, with the manufacturers, uh, representatives, and such, you know, to make, help, help make, make a better product. And that's just the 80 gallons and above, right? Right. So what percentage you think of homes have 80 gallons? You know, I can, you know, I would have to go back to my computer to see if I have numbers on, on the sizes of water computers that we estimate, you know, throughout the service territory. Maybe that it just looks like what the fuel source is on the water heaters, you know, which is for us is largely electric, you know, it's small. Probably, you know, off the top of my head, I think we assume about 98% electric, 2% uh, propane. And there are heat pump water heaters with tanks less than 80. Right. Yeah, I thought yeah. that are 50. Right. Yeah. Except um, you can still buy a, a whole heat pump without the heat, or the whole heat pump without the heat pump on it if it's 50 or more. It has to be 50 right. And the cost is considerably more. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
think in the, you have the option of running it straight resistance and or on the heat pump. Right. And uh, we did that in the spring uh, one year for one month without the heat pump and one month uh, with the heat pump. A in conjunction with the, because it, the heat pump can't provide enough water, then the resistance heaters come on and, and keep your water hot. So, uh, I think we, at that time, found a savings of about 20 cents a day uh, between the, uh, running on just the heat pump, you know, the heat pump and the strips and straight strips, uh, which take a long time to pay you know, for the cost of the you know, uh, And I just wonder if they've they, they become more efficient. Uh, I think that, that the original ones were designed uh, to operate in a uh, no, they were operate in an enclosed space where maybe you had a, a wood heater or a, a furnace of some kind, and, and that, that was to uh, rob the heat that was wasted or excess uh, in that particular room. I think the current units are optimal for in an attached garage where there's <coughs> some heat from the space, but it's still located outside of the heated space, so you don't rot any heat, you know, that then you would have to make up with your existing heating system. And on average, I think it's about a thousand kilowatt hours per year that we get from these heat pump water heaters. So we get they're, they're, they're different types of models, uh, with efficiency standards. So there's a tier one and a tier two, and I think the upper tier, a tier two unit is. 1,600 kilowatt hours a year, and for tier one unit, it's around 1,000 kilowatt hours a year. Another claim, but I think I think those and those values come from the regional technical forum. But they're just sort of, you know, they haven't done, you know, they, they haven't been on the market long enough, you know, for them to do a you know study across the region to see exactly how they perform. I think that just comes from laboratory results. I read someplace about two hundred dollars. I, not, not often, you know, I typically what I try to do is stay really far away from quoting dollar amounts you know, because really the, the actual value is going to vary so much, you know, because, you know, the actual energy use is really more dependent on how you interact with the equipment and the size of your household and how you yeah. laundry well, and shower yeah, and all definitely. these things. So I don't, I don't like to get it <laughs> far enough. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, but it's, that's almost as, almost as bad as given a, a KWH. Number. Uh, True. I, I agree. Like, no, it's uh, exactly the same. But 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 what I'm talking about KWH values is, has to do with reporting, you know, to to BPA. The numbers I quote is what we get per unit that we report to BPA, but so we can then count towards this, this target. So true or not, it is an actual fixed number. So the conventional water uh, here, they posted on mine is fifty five hundred kilowatt hours a year or something like that. So you're saying you're saving a thousand. 20% or so. I'm saying that's what we get to claim. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, let's just say that's what you say. Yeah. <laughs> well, it used to be. Uh, no, I know. I know this story. <laughs> and like, I think when Ted installed his, the requirements were it was really an unheated part of the home. So a garage or something maybe with the, the furnace air handling unit there so there's a little waste heat. But the newer ones, they do allow you to put it in your laundry room if that's in the heated part of the house. And I think the savings are adjusted downward if it's in the heated part of the home. But always struck me as um, a little bit odd that you put something in your laundry room that you used to have this hot water tank that provided a little heat loss and kept things warm. Now you're gonna have this air conditioner running okay. in, in your laundry room. Yeah. But, it, you know, they they allow that now. So you lose it. Noise levels, <laughs> are, are they? There's a little bit of noise. I mean, it's key that they're installed correctly, you know, because you need to, for earthquake purposes, you need to attach it to the wall. And because there's a compressor sitting on top, you know, I've heard of some, some installations where the vibration will reverberate throughout the house. But, you know, I mean, as long as you do it correctly, I, you know, I, there's really no noise issues. 
but it's important to be aware of it. Part of the requirements for the program actually is that the installer has taken a instructional video or instructional course which is available in YouTube yeah. where they go through just those types of things you know, to ensure that, you know, it's it just essentially to ensure that the customers uh, you know, get what they need. Yeah, the important thing is we get credit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then moving along to the commercial potential, slide seven, and you know, it's sort of you know, good representative of the commercial sector. It's really you know, a lot of different things. You know, we don't have the same uniformity in the commercial sector as we do in the residential. But the, the biggest potential is uh, HVAC heating and air conditioning controls of the controls of the equipment, as well as the equipment itself. Um, there's a big big potential in commercial lighting, both exterior and interior lighting, uh, refrigeration and, and commercial envelopes. In the future, is this desk, uh, thermostat, and all the associated smart home stuff? Is that something? That's that a, well, that's, this is a little bit different. So, so the Nest isn't really, uh, you know, there's no thermostat in the residential the future sector. Although there is recently been conversations about how do you account for and count behavioral energy savings. And we're not quite there yet, but there's a lot of conversation about you should be able to attribute some savings and claim some savings based on behavioral changes. Yeah, yeah we've been courted by a company called Old Power, who you know, have a really interesting product Lots of savings potential. It's just you know, it's also cost a bit of money, so we're you know not quite there yet. You know, but it's definitely something we're paying attention to because it could have a significant impact on, on how we meet the target. The target. Yeah. How how does that work? Yeah, yeah. How are you going to get credit for behavioral? Well, what they do. Well, what they do is they they select our customer, they segment our customers into two separate groups. And they only get savings, so there's a control group who is not involved in the project, and then there's a group of people who's involved with the project. And those who are involved would get marketing sent out to them. They get, you know, you know, how it gets sent out is sort of a little bit up to us if we were to choose it, but about four times a year they get a energy use report where they compare the home's energy use to customers of similar types, so they, you know, collect all this data about the customers and then segment them. So you get a comparison to somebody, you know, let's say you were involved in the project there, you know, somebody who lives in a similar house, you would find out if you use more or less than that other household. And then along with that comes with suggestions of what you could do to help reduce your energy use. And then what they do is they do statistical sample on, on the control group and the uncontrolled group, and they get about 3% savings across the whole uh, control group out of them, which okay. adds up to a significant <laughs> amount. And and there's actually been some you know pretty thorough studies on their approach. You know that you know so I think the the savings are statistically reliable. You know the question is just more how long they're sustained. You know so if we run this program for two years and then we stop sending out reports, what do the customers do? Does their energy use go back up again? You know, it's just a very different approach to, like, let's say, Dr. C pump. You know, because once that unit sits on the wall, they'll keep saving energy until it breaks, and then presumably they'll repair it and they'll keep using the Dr. C pump. Presumably. Presumably. Yeah, I think that goes with right to privacy. <laughs> okay, where are we? Yep. We're, well, let's just move on to eight for the industrial sector. Um, you know, and for scale, you can see how the potential really shrinks. You know, most of our potential is in the residential sector because we are a the residential utility. Um, but the biggest potential is water and wastewater, you know, which primarily really is actually the city of Squim, but also the smaller wastewater systems that we have um, throughout our district. And then, of course, wood manufacturing, which really is all about inner four, um, which is located west out of town here. Um, and then, of course, the indoor ag, you know, which is which is an interesting potential because there's just uncertainty around the industry, as you all are aware. And then BPA, you know, like the traditional measurement groups, BPA is not involved in any study on what the savings potential are. 
Um, you know, so at some point, though, you know, if, if uh, the marijuana laws stay in the state, you know, we're going to have to address that savings potential somehow. Uh, lastly, on uh, potential is the distribution efficiency on slide nine. You know, where you know, I think we've been here talking before about the distribution efficiency project that we do. And, um, we have a, sort of a plan to address all of these savings over time, we're working pretty closely with John Purvis, you know, which is really, really good project and a really cost-effective way to meet these targets. And then moving along to slide 10 is sort of a historical view of how we've been dealing with this uh, Energy Independence Act. Uh, the green line there represents the targets with, uh, which we've had, and you can see how the target really was up during 2012, 13 biennium, and since then it's been you know, steadily creeping down. Um, and then you can see how, you know, how we require conservation. The big, big blips where it sticks up are years when we've done CFL mailers. And then 2015, you know, which is entirely closed out, but it's sort of similar to the, the free advanced power scripts that we just sent out. And then the plan to acquire conservation to meet this target. So like we mentioned, since we're going over the target with this current biennium, we get to, so while the target is down 40%, 20% of the next biennium's target will come from the current biennium. So we actually have to acquire even less savings because of the efforts we've done in the past two years. Um, you know, and that, once I get a little closer into looking at my numbers, you know, presumably it will make sense to go over this target as well, so that we can continue to carry forward savings into the future. Because at some time, presumably, the target may go up when market prices will go up. Also, note that the NEON numbers here are just estimates. Like, I have, have not received any projections at all from NEON, but, but that should probably be coming this spring. And, you know, consistent with everything else, I'm assuming that what NEON will give us will continue to go down. And then to close it up on slide 12, uh, like Fred mentioned, that we will be coming back with a resolution to adopt a target for the next biennium and establish a potential for the next 10 years. Um, the, we'll be uh, we're working on sort of revising our acquisition strategy to figure out you know, really what, who this lower target will make the most sense for us in terms of how we acquire the savings and which programs we push or not push. And then we plan to close out uh, this current biennium, you know, well over target. There's a resolution based on the CPA. Correct, and so between now and then, if you have an opportunity to, you know, review the report and have questions, um, you know, we'll take feedback and we'll continue to, to look at it. And uh, but the the plan is on the 14th, we'll have the target based on this report for the board's approval. So if you have any questions at all, let's look through it. Just feel free to get hold of me. I have to talk to you about it. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go into an executive session, uh, but I think we'll have a break and come back and, and do that.